from the Words with Historical Society. Welcome everyone for coming. You all probably know, if you don't already know, this is Jim Garman. We're very fortunate to have him as our town historian. Somebody was saying to me today, uh, when I was telling them I was coming tonight, they said how lucky we are because he's so renowned for really doing his homework. You can believe what he says. He's a really good researcher and you know you're going to get a lot of great, solid information. So he's extremely um, generous with his time and his collection. So without further uh, ado. got the membership. There's some membership forms over there. Oh, I was going to say that at the end when I thank you. Okay. So <laughs> anyway, if you're not already, if you are a member, we thank you. If you're not a member yet and would like to join, we have membership forms here. You can see this handsome <laughs> gentleman in the light blue named Paul. He has membership forms. You can see this at the end. So I thank you. And now it's all yours. Okay, steamboats on the bay and on the river. Uh, the steamboats on the bay, there, there really were a lot of them. Uh, and it wasn't just the Fall River Line. The Fall River Line was, was one of actually 12 sound, Long Island Sound, steamboat uh, operations. There were steamboats from Boston that went around the Cape to New York. There were steamboats that went from Fall River to New York, Newport to New York, Stonington to New York, etc. And um, so what I'm going to talk about mostly, though, is the Fall River Line and also the Sakonet, uh River steamers, only because that's a particular topic I'm really interested in, and they were steamboats, and they were really, it's really cool. When you think about living in Providence in, in 1890, and you want to get out of there and take a trip to Sakonet Point, it's really a, a special <laughs> opportunity for you. So um, I have a lot of photographs and postcards. I'm, I have a lot of text at the beginning of this. You may have to bear with me a little bit. But, um, well, let me just get started. We do live on an island, as you all know. And we got water everywhere. Uh, when we think about bridges, the first bridge off this island was 1792, and that was what later became the Stone Bridge. It was at that location to Tiverton. Uh, they built it in, in 1792, and before the year was over, it had washed out, most of you who have been on a boat going through that area, you know how the rip goes through there. And so the, uh, that was the first bridge. The second bridge was 1795. Uh, eventually there were about seven stone bridges until the, the last one was in 1912. The, um, that was the only bridge off the island until 1929 when the, when the uh, Mount Hope Bridge was built. So we relied on ferries a lot the first ferry off the island was in 1640. 
1640. So, uh, you know, we've had ferries forever, at least until the building of the Newport Bridge and opening of it in 1968. So, um, we do have to be in contact with the mainland every once in a while and have to go all the way to Providence sometimes. Um, but in the days of, of Roger Williams and William Coddington and Ann Hutchinson and so on, travel for the most part was by canoe or other types of boats. Um, uh, the purchase of Aquidneck Island with the help of Roger Williams, the locals uh, purchased it by taking a boat trip to the Narragansett country to meet with uh, Canonicus and, and Miantonomi to negotiate the purchase of this island, which they got for uh, a real bargain, something like Manhattan was purchased for. Okay, later though, we had other types of boats around the bay. Uh, we even had in the 1840s, we had a horse-powered boat, a ferry that was, was run by two horses on a treadmill. How that worked, I can't imagine. I have a sketch of it, but I don't have a photograph of it. There wasn't photography much at that point. So, but what I'm going to talk about most today is the steam-powered ships that provided travel for uh, the area, and equally important <coughs> and never discussed much was that the ships that uh, ran this bay and to New York and so on carried an extremely amount, light, large amount of freight. A lot of freight was shipped on these beautiful steamboats, the floating palaces and so on, uh, that, were, that were built. So freight is, is equally important to comfort, shall we say. So um, in the early, uh, the, the steamboats flourished in the, from the mid-19th century up until the 1930s or so. Okay. And of course, over time, a lot of the freight and fish and things like that that were shipped came to be shipped by truck as opposed to being shipped by, by steamboat. But it's a great era that I'm going to talk about today, so I hope you enjoy the ride. The steamboat was not invented by Robert Fulton. Robert Fulton was the first American to, to play with that, and the, the French and a number of other Europeans were doing steamboats as early as the 1780s. But Fulton's first effort in 1807 was titled the North River Steamboat. And it traveled the, the 150 miles from New York City to Albany in only 32 hours. Of course, keep in mind, that's upstream. Uh, but it was also revert, referred to at the time as Fulton's Folly. Anyway, the technology advanced very quickly. This is a, a, a photograph of a recreation of the North River Steamboat. It's not the original. Again, photography, maybe I should mention this since I was a professional photographer. Photography came to the United States in 1841. And it was brought here from Europe. It was invented in Europe in the 1838-39 period. And it came to the United States in 1841. And the person that brought it to the United States was a man by the name of Samuel F. B. Morse, who, who not only invented the Morse code, but he also was an extraordinarily talented artist. So Morse brought photography to the United States and the technological uh, development of photography was quite dramatic uh, as we should know. We had photographers in the field at the time of the Civil War and creating some really gross images of warfare. So the late 18th century in Europe, uh, in 1787 there was a trial in Philadelphia of a steamboat and among the attendees to that were all the members of the Constitutional Convention who went out to, to see the show. But after Fulton's Folly in 1807, the steamboat age really took off. It took, for a while, uh, took a while for them to replace the sailing boats, but part of that was because the sailboat operators didn't want to be replaced, as we'll see a specific example in Narragansett Bay. The, the tradition of sailing died quite hard, uh, even for transport, the kind of things that these steamboats did in replacing them. But by the 1840s and 1850s, things were changing quite dramatically. There were paddle steamers, and paddle steamers was the main form of motivation for, for the ships. They had a paddle wheel, which is mounted on either side or both sides in some cases early on, and then later at the stern of the ship. 
and the first ocean-going ocean -going steamboat to make a voyage across part of the ocean was the Savannah, which was built in 1819, and it sailed from Liverpool to Ireland in 23 days. That, they realized it was kind of impractical though, it was a small boat, it had to carry a lot of coal, uh, and it just didn't have the room for it. So, eventually those early paddle wheel steamers were also equipped with sails, just in case. And they used them in some of the early days too. The invention of the screw propeller in 1849 brought about a change, and the change also from wood construction to iron construction was uh, a significant advance for the use of steamboats. Again, the era of the steamboats, at least locally, 1817 uh, to 1938. Navy ships also began to be uh, made with iron hulls at the time of the Civil War, although there were a lot of sailboats in the Civil War as well, sailing ships that is. Narragansett Bay, there's a long seafaring tradition here that goes back to the earliest founders of the, um, of the colony, and um, the founders uh, did travel across the bay to purchase this island that we're on. In the late 17th century, late 1600s, there were four settlements in Rhode Island, Providence, Portsmouth, Newport, and Warwick, in that order. That's the order they were founded. Okay. In, this is 16, 1640, 1650, in that period, actually. And they were linked together, obviously, by water transportation. That was the only way that you could communicate from one place to another. And the first, they had the ferries. The first ferry, again, was 1640. It was the Bristol Ferry. And that tradition continued down till the Mount Hope Bridge was built. In Narragansett Bay, the first steamboat appeared in Narragansett Bay. It was the Firefly, and it appeared on May 26, 1817. She had made the transit from New York City under steam power to Newport in only 28 hours. I'll mention later on that the record for the Fall River Line ships coming to from New York to Newport was uh, just a little over eight hours. Firefly had been built to run on the Hudson River and was an internal kind of thing. It, it really was, uh, had a lot of difficulty. The biggest difficulty for the early steamboats seemed to be getting around Point Judith. The, the, the waters there were, were very difficult for the, for the boats. Once they made that turn and got into Narragansett Bay, it was a lot simpler. But anyway, they, the Firefly ran from Newport to Providence, and it normally took three hours to get there. There was a lot of opposition to steamboat, the first steamboat, and the, the sailboats actually outran the Firefly <coughs> and took over the business and, and undercut them on, on uh, uh, fares and everything, just trying to uh, get rid of her, and it worked. She left uh, about after about four months. 1826, there were a number of steamboat lines established on the bay. Again, uh, some of them were within the bay, and including Sakonet River. Some of them were, um, were out into, the, into Long Island Sound. None of, them, none of the steamboat lines ever ran around Long Island. It was always inside, uh, on, on the Connecticut side, um, for their <coughs> trips that they, they took. Again, a note that I mentioned before and I'll mention again, they carried freight more than passengers, even though they carried a lot of passengers, they carried even more freight. Fall River Line um, was at least equally a freight line as well as a passenger line. The 1840s saw a number of steamboats in action on the bay. The first, one of the early ones was the Bradford Durfee. There's no early because, I mean, there's no individual one other than the Firefly. Um, but the Bradford Durfee was one. The Perry ran Newport to Fall River and later Newport to Providence in 1846. Metacomet, which is one of the early Indians around here, uh, ran in 1854 to 1863. In 1874, Richard A. Borden arrived. This was at a very prominent steamship, and I have a picture of it. <coughs> that hangs in my house. 
This is the Richard A. Borden at Bristol Ferry. It's in the background there. And, and one of my former students at the Abbey gave me a, a glass plate negative of this picture and I had it processed and those glass plates were so great. And if you look closely at this picture, you can actually see the, ho the hats on the women on the, on the steamship. But that's the Richard A. Borden. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about him in a minute. That's one of my favorite steamship pictures. Okay, um, it ran, began in 1874 and ran Newport to Providence in the winter and later uh, it was sold to the Joy Line, which was another line that went into business in 1899 and it served until 1910. In 1896, the Fall River and Newport Steamship Company was created, one of the many steamboats companies locally, and a steamboat company that later uh, became the Fall River Line. More on that in a minute. One of the local favorites was the Mount Hope. This is the Mount Hope, uh, which t ran from Block Island to Newport in May of 1888 and later to Rocky Point. Uh, it was a very, there were a lot of steamboats that went over to Rocky Point. And it was still on the bay until 1936, and it was abandoned at that point in the Providence River, and it's still there. I saw a photograph recently of its submerged hull in the Providence River. It's, it's one of those things that's really in the way when they're trying to clean up the, fall, the Providence River. Anyway, on to the Fall River Line so-called floating palaces, which was a, a label that was given to them. Fall River Line lasted the longest, 91 years, and was a subject, as we all know, of a great deal of local historic lore. During most of its existence, the Fall River Line was closely associated with railroads, and it worked in tandem with rail travel. The most important person early on for the uh, steamship company was Richard A. Borden. He was a Fall River industrialist. He created the Fall River Iron Works with Bradford Durfee, and he later was involved in the textile business uh, with the Borden Mill, which was one of the early mills of uh, Fall River. He started a steamship service from Fall River to Providence in 1827, he built the Fall River Railroad with connections to Boston in 1844. Now let me digress a little bit about the railroads. The railroads started in Boston to places like Plymouth and the North Shore and from Boston. The first one of, sub of substance was the Old Colony Railroad. And the Old Colony Railroad spiderwebbed from Boston out into the south, um, southern part of Massachusetts and eventually got to Fall River. And when it got to Fall River, it came to be known as the Old Colony and Fall River Railroad. Okay. That became a problem later on because eventually that railroad, rail line was extended to Newport. And so they decided to change the name to Old Colony and Newport Railroad. That was built, the railroad we have on the West Shore right now was built between 1862 and 1864 during the Civil War. Anyway, the people of Fall River were very incensed about the fact that their name was being taken off the railroad. Okay. So, Borden created the Bay State Steamboat Company, which later became the Fall River Line, and it has about four other names, by the way, later. The, the Fall River Line is what stuck, though, uh, in terms of that. His first steamboat was the Bay State, and then the Empire State, and there are pictures of some of these up here, and they ran from Fall River to New York City and were immediately extremely successful. The connection between the railroad and the steamboats was that the railroad, Old Colony Railroad, came down to Fall River as early as about 1844, I think it was, and you could get off the railroad car from Boston, walk across the pier, and get on one of the steamboats of the Fall River Line. You didn't have to, usually you didn't even have to wait. They had the time schedule worked out very closely. And in fact, in some cases, the, um, as we'll see later on, the steamboat companies came under the ownership, <coughs> ownership of the uh, railroads. They were very closely tied. So the 
the ste steamboat line later was sold to Boston, Newport, and New York Steamboat Company. And so the Old Colony Railroad was extended. As long as the Old Colony Railroad ended in Fall River, the steamboats would, stop, would start from Fall River and stop at Newport. They were mostly night boats, by the way. They would leave Fall River around 6, they would leave Newport around 9, and they would get into New York around 6 or 7 in the morning. Okay. You'll hear more about that later on. Eventually, new steamboats were added to the line, the Old Colony and the Newport. The Newport, with a little bit of research that I was able to do on Bob Watts' panorama up here, I think the Newport is the steamboat that is tied up at Long Wharf in that panorama. You can look at that afterwards. That panorama is 1871, mm -hmm. and uh, it, the Newport got on this line in 1867. The builders of the big steamboats were, for the most part, in New York and Philadelphia, and obviously in New York, nearby uh, New Jersey as well. And so they were, these steamboats that I just mentioned were 373 feet in length and a gross weight of 3,000 tons. They were pretty big boats, but they got bigger. By the 1850, there were other lines going to New York from different locations. Some went straight from Providence to New York. Uh, some went from Boston, and as I said, went around the Cape. But that was a long trip, a long diversion for that trip, as I'll give you the numbers in a minute. There was an individual financier in the 1867 by the name of Jim Fisk. Jim Fisk was, one, was an early entrepreneur in all kinds of investments. And he renamed it the Narragansett Steamboat Company. Tim Fisk was a, a, a bit of a character. When the Fall River steamboats, or when his steamboats, left New York, he would <coughs> get dressed up in his admiral's uniform. He wasn't an admiral, but he just got dressed up like one, and would welcome everybody and make a great show of the, the steamboat and everything and ride it out a little ways into the harbor and then get on a smaller boat and go back. And, and he did that all the time. It was just really kind of his, his little toy Eventually, we got the old Colony Steamboat Company in 1872 because it merged with the railroad. Here's the Richard A. Board in the picture I showed you before uh, at uh, uh, Bristol Ferry. It arrived in 74. It ran from Lock Island to Providence in the summer and Fall River to Providence in the winter. This was a pretty big boat. It carried seven to 800 passengers. Some of the ones later were much bigger. Uh, and later it was sold to the Joy Line. The Joy Line was created, as I said, in 1899 and renamed the Fairfield. Joy Line sailed uh, in the bay as well. Eventually it was dismantled in 1910. Now we get to the four biggies. The Fall River Line itself had as many as 11 steamboats at any one time. Uh, in fact, when it went out of business, they had nine. But there were four significant ones that uh, are most important. And the first of those is Pilgrim. This is a postcard that, that they gave away on the steamboats for people to um, you know, write, write home about their voyage. And postcards before about 19, 1906 or 7, postcards, the only thing you could put on the back was the name and address of the addressee. And so that's why this white band is on the bottom of these postcards, because uh, that was where you wrote your message. Okay. So Pilgrim was launched in 1882. At that time, it was the world's largest steamboat, double hull. That was unusual. 390 feet long and 3,500 tons. It could c accommodate 1,200 passengers. And you know, th these steamboats, a lot of them had 12 to 1,500 passengers, and they really had a lot of, a lot of those rooms and facilities filled. They could make the trip, this pilgrim could make the trip to Fall River to New York in eight and a half hours. That's fast. That's about, I think I figured it out, I think somewhere, 22, 24 knots. Okay, and that's moving. And, and when you get out of Newport, out of Narragansett Bay into the ocean, things got a little rough sometimes. This is an advertisement for Pilgrim. 
And if you can't read it, I will, I'll read it to you. You might be able to see it. Anyway, of the interior, this is a quote from their brochure. Of the interior arrangements, that Karobi said they are indeed palatial, with all that can be implied from that term. Her grand saloons, uh, I think they use the term saloon as salon, okay? Her grand saloons, cabins, staterooms, and social halls and dining halls are equal to anything found on land. A thousand persons in her grand saloons at one time only served to animate the scene without the least appearance of crowding. In the grand saloons of an evening, the recherche orchestral performances attracted audiences representing the wealth and culture and fame of every nation and people. You wonder how many people slept over on these boats at night. They could party all night. Anyway, that's kind of a nice drawing room there on the Pilgrim. Pilgrim had a, uh, a, a painting at the top of its grand staircase of uh, Governor Endicott, who was one of the early governors of Massachusetts Bay. And his portrait is hangs. You see that in some of these books. You'll see a picture of, of him there. Next, we have Puritan. Again, there are four. This is number two. Puritan was built at Chester, Pennsylvania, crossing Philadelphia. Launched in 1889, 419 feet. Each one gets bigger, by the way. Uh, 4,600 ton displacement. And the first of its line to have a steel hull. It served until 1908. And in, uh, made, it made the trip to, from Fall River to New York, 176 miles in 8 hours <coughs> and 24 minutes. And we have some, a, another line postcard. There's the portrait of Governor uh, Endicott there. And again, you have on the lower one, you have the Puritan leaving its pier in Fall River and landing place of the Fall River line at Newport, which was Long Wharf, by the way. It came in at, at, at the foot of Long Wharf. Big transaction business-wise in um, 1893. At that time, the New York, New Haven, and Hartford Railroad, which again had taken over almost all the railroads in New England, it began to acquire steamboat companies in 1820, 1892. And in 93, they acquired uh, the uh, steamboat company that again came to be, in our minds anyway, the old uh, Fall River Line. This was a period of, of tremendous growth of business in the United States, tremendous consolidation. It was a time of, of from the end of the Civil War until, until World War I, really, 1914, uh, there were all kinds of in, industrial and mergings and, and so on going on in big business. And a lot of fortunes were made. And of course, that's the, the period when Newport <coughs> becomes known as the Gilded Age. And the Gilded Age is a term that was uh, created by Mark Twain. And Mark Twain said, it's a gilded age, it's not exactly a golden age. It's gold leaf. Okay, that was his, his uh, use of the term. But of course, as we know in Newport, the, the gilded age is the period of, of significant construction of mansions, all trying to compete to build one bigger and better and so on. That the, uh, it is a period of significant growth of business and significant growth of wealth in the United States. Next we have the Priscilla. And, and this postcard is kind of funny. It looks like it's, it's striped for war protection or something, but that's just the fault in the card itself. Priscilla was launched in 1894. It was the largest side wheel steamer afloat, 440 feet in length, and it could accommodate 1,500 passengers with a crew of 200. Okay. Think about it. And they, they filled these boats in the summertime at least. They ran year-round, by the way. Less of a schedule in the, uh, in, in the off-season. But especially from probably oh, April or so until October, uh, there was at least one running every night each direction. Now, to show you more clearly where they were, where they came in in Newport, we have this photograph. There's a steamboat, get my pointer. There's a steamboat right here tied up at the wharf. This is Long Wharf. Long Wharf, there's, there's the uh, Cardine's baseball field down there. That was a pond, that was, that was water, later filled in. 
But the railroad, as you can see, came right out to the steamboat. You got off the, off the train, walked across the, the, the uh, area there, and got onto a steamboat. Again, everything was very convenient because, of course, they were all owned by the same company. The Newport Railroad Station uh, was actually closer to where the small railroad station has been by the Marriott there for the last few years. That's where Newport had a rather sizable station there. But there was a side track that bypassed that and went on down to the end of the wharf. And they had a uh, turntable in there as well, and they were able to turn the train around and head it back north. The, 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 uh, what's interesting about this photograph is I wonder how often these people got water in their backyard or if not their house. Okay. But the steamboat's there. This, this long thing in the background is a, a, like a, a wharf that went out to the uh, lighthouse on Goat Island. There was not all that land built around where the Gurney Hotel is today, uh, but it was just this boardwalk kind of thing that went out to the lighthouse, which was out, out at the end. And of course, the, at this time, this is probably about 1900, 1910, the uh, uh, torpedo station was functioning out there too. A lot of the people who worked on the steamboats lived in the point section. Now we probably have some Hummers here today, but the point section in those days was a, an industrial centered housing area. Not quite what it is today with all the million dollar houses that are there. But it was colonial, a lot of colonial houses, but that's that's where a lot of the workers who worked on the steamboats uh, lived. Okay, next steamboat, the Providence. There were two Providences. There had been one earlier. This was the, the big one, uh, built in, launched in 1905, 397 feet, and designed by a man by the name of Charles Pierce. Charles Pierce designed all of the major steamboats that I've just talked about uh, up until this time, although when he designed, uh, Pierce designed this one, but he died while it was being built. And so the building supervisor was uh, Howland Gardner, who again uh, made a great name for himself when he brought about the fourth one, the Commonwealth. The interior of the Providence was uh, French Renaissance style. Some of these steamboats had as many as six or seven different uh, architectural styles inside. And, uh, but this is the Providence flying all its flags going down the bay. Another view of the Providence is this one. I don't think they worried about black smoke back in those days. The, uh, anyway, uh, okay, so that's, that's Providence. And again, it was one of the largest and one of the ones that was around for a long time. Finally, the last one of these four big ones was Commonwealth. Commonwealth is the largest inland water steamer built in the United States in 1908. 456 feet long, 6,000 gross tons, 421 staterooms, and seven different architectural styles in the interior. The advertising for Commonwealth said, every advantage which experience or foresight could suggest has been utilized in the building of the Commonwealth. Designed by J. Howell Gardner, built in Philadelphia and New York. And it was referred to as the Queen of the Sound. It was the biggest for a number of years. And this is a better picture of it. That's gigantic. And, and another view of it in dry dock gives you more of a, a realization of the size of it. I don't want to step up for those cords. There are people standing right here. <laughs> gives you an idea of just how huge it was. One of the things about the Fall River Line was that it was very popular with honeymooners. Whoops, okay. The honeymooners. Uh, a lot of people did, had their honeymoon going to New York and so on. And one of the frequent passengers, and there were a lot of frequent passengers, by the way, people who sometimes you know, go down to New York for a day and come back the next day, or even for one day, turn around. But a, a passenger by the name of Harry Von Tilzer composed a song titled The Old Fall River Line. 
And, and he composed a lot of popular songs in the days like Wait Till the Sun Shines Nelly or I Want a Girl Just Like the Girl Who Married Dear Old Dad. We know those songs, I think. Here are some of the uh, lyrics from the old Fall River line. And if you really are interested, you can go to YouTube and you can hear it. <laughs> I didn't record it, however. It sounds awful. <laughs> anyway, this is the sheet music for it. Okay. And you can find that too. Let me digress one just for a personal story here. In, uh, oh, about, there, there, were, there were three people in Newport who were very active in photographing and writing about and everything the Fall River Line. The three people were a man by the name of Will Warren, Ralph Arnold, and the other one was, um, yeah, well, I can't remember his name, William King Koval. Koval lived on the point and had an incredible collection of photographs of that. They all were photogra photographers and they all had collections. And I heard, they died quite a while ago. Will Warren was still alive in Jamestown about seven or eight years ago. And um, so I wrote to him and see what, to see what photographs he had that might be helpful to my collection. Anyway, I found out by communicating that his, he had just died. And his wife said, why don't you come over and see what's here? So I did. And I got some pictures, I got a bunch of negatives of the working waterfront of Newport which I printed, and I have an, that's another album. In any case, one thing she showed me was a chest of drawers about five, six feet high, and inside that chest of drawers was nothing but Fall River Line memorabilia. She wasn't selling that, though. In any case, I think that went, and, and I should put out a commercial for the um, Marine Museum in Fall River. It's, a, it's part of Battleship Cove, and um, I went up to update myself on it about two weeks ago and found out that it was closed for the winter. Uh, but it's a really incredible museum. You can park at the, uh, at, at the uh, Battleship Massachusetts and walk a block to it. One of the things they have in there is a model of Titanic that is, I'm going to guess now, probably about eight feet long. It is huge it's, and the detail is incredible. But that's, that's the main museum in this area that has Fall River Line stuff. They got King Koval's collection. I'm sure they got Will Warren's as well. And uh, there's a ton of stuff there. It's really a cool museum to go take a look at. What's the name of the museum? The Maritime Museum in Fall, at Battleship Cove. Yeah, it's really special. You get a chance once it opens, uh, you really should go see it. I'm, I'm certainly going to go back, especially after doing this research. I went up to get an update on research and found out it was closed for the winter. Anyway, um, so what, what happens with the steamboat lines then, as we turn the century, they, there were more and more consolidations and the number of, of lines diminished somewhat as they combined with other lines. Here you have some of the other ones, the Providence Line, the Norwich Line, the Stonington Line, the New Bedford Line. Some of them only had one or two ships and they you know, were not as off, running as often as the Fall River Line. But Stonington was a big port for steamboat lines at that point. And again, you could take the railroad to Stonington eventually and get on a steamboat there. So they, they all became absorbed, though, by the New York, New Haven, and Hartford Railroad. The Joy Line was, was late. There's a book up here of the Joy Line. And uh, by the way, I should say about these books, most of these books um, I got off eBay. If you go to Fall River Line on eBay, there's a ton of stuff there. And this one book in particular <coughs> that says that Splendor, trying to read upside down, Splendor Sails the Sound has an incredible number of photographs of all the steamboat lines that were in Long Island Sound. And that was a fairly reasonable priced book, I don't know, $25 or something. And there were a lot of them advertised on eBay. So check out eBay if you want to 
get some more information on this. The Joy Line, though, began operation in 1899 in the Bay, and not from Newport, though. I, just Providence, I think it was, to New York. They built a drawbridge in New London, which brought about direct rail access uh, between Boston and New York. And in 1914, they opened the Cape Cod Canal, which, was, uh, which cut the trip from Boston to New York by the out outer line by 70 miles. It was a 264-mile trip before that. You probably can see why, you just use your imagination. If you're in Boston and you want to go to New York, the really easiest way to do it is take the train to Fall River and then get on a steamboat, rather than go all the way around the Cape. In any case, what came to happen, though, during this time was the fact that these efficiencies, and obviously the <laughs> difference in railroads between the old colony line in 1844 and the New York, New Haven, and Hartford in 1900, was dramatic in terms of much larger, faster uh, trains and so on. It was easier just to get on a train and stay there uh, to New York. And so the use of steamboats on the bay began to decline somewhat. And there were consolidations and the uh, you know, traffic declined somewhat. There were other ways to do it. And there were other ways to ship the freight as well, which was uh, a big part of the financial success of the steamboats. Now what I'm going to show you next is a layout of, it, it comes from a booklet, the booklet's in one of these albums here, but it shows the layout of all the steamboats, all the big steamboats. And it's pretty hard to read there, I, it's pretty hard, I can't read it where I'm looking at on my computer either. But this is 1926, and in 1926 on the uh, Priscilla, I think it was. There was one cabin right behind the pilot house that cost $10. Most of the fare, and again, we have to think about inflation, most of the fare for the overnight trip to New York was a dollar and a half. Most of those, it has the prices here, you can't read it, it's all blurred. But the prices, most of them were a dollar and a half. You could, you could spend two fifty or five dollars. But there was only one cabin that was $10. That must have been the executive suite or something. Anyway, this book has all the steamboats. And, and what their layout was shows the, the dining halls, the grand saloons, everything. Really an interesting archive. It's in one of these, al one of these two albums up here. So a lot of competition in the steamboat business. A lot of competition for passengers and freight. The railroads were running the steamboats, and of course the steamboats in some ways were competing with the railroads. There was another line that survived called the Colonial Line, and the Colonial Line provided fierce competition for the Fall River Line in the 20s and 30s, and actually the Colonial Line survived until 1942, and it went out of business during World War II. The Colonial Line was uh, the chief competitor in later years for the uh, Fall River Line. In 1935, the New York, New Haven, Hartford went into bankruptcy. We all know the ultimate fate of railroads. They, they declined significantly. Um, passenger service on the, the old colony in Newport Line ceased in 1938. They still carried freight down to about 1984, uh, but they, no passenger service. And, and passenger service on the old colony in Newport Line in 1913, there were eight trains every day into Newport and eight trains out of Newport in 1913. Now those trains might have had only one or two passenger cars, <coughs> but that railroad was a, a, was a busy railroad. And of course the problem with the the old colony and Newport Railroad was you only could go from Newport to Fall River and further on. But you had to change trains in Fall River to go to Providence. There was a Providence Fall River line. There also was a, a uh, um, another line that ran from Bristol to Providence. And the route of that line is what is the East Bay Bike Path today. 
that was a real line as well. Anyway, New York New Haven Harper went into bankruptcy in 1935, and by 1937 they seriously considered the idea of no longer financing the Sound steamboats, which were losing money. In 1936, that company, which owned the Fall River Line, operated a deficit of almost $1.3 million, and, and that was a lot. We have a tendency today to you know, sort of throw off a million dollars here and there when we start talking about a company losing money or something. Uh, the, uh, but that was a sizable amount of money, and they soon went into bankruptcy. Now, we can't talk about all the glory of the steamboat lines without talking about some of the problems. They had, the Fall River Line had an amazing safety record, but there were some groundings and collisions. And I have some pictures coming up on some of those. Uh, but when you consider that there was a steamboat going each way every night, the record was pretty remarkable. But we do have to take a look at a couple. The Bristol, which was one of the Fall River Line steamboats, burned to the water line at Newport at Long Wharf just after all the passengers got off in December of 1888. The first Providence ran aground near Bristol back in the 1870s. The really gross one was the Joy Line's Larchmont. The Larchmont out off Point Judith collided with another ship between Point Judith and Block Island on a foggy night in February of 1907, and it sank. It sank quite rapidly, and only 17 of the 128 people on board survived, and they floated debris uh, to, uh, to the Rhode Island coast. The Larchmont was, was one of the very worst uh, accidents that took place. And this is a postcard of the Larchmont up here. The Commonwealth ran into a, an anchored battleship off Goat Island, the New Hampshire, and I don't know how clearly you can see that, but there's this big gouge in the stern of the New Hampshire. This was in heavy fog, July of 1912. I think a well, they were steel ships at that point. It did a job on the New Hampshire. Um, the Plymouth collided with the city of Taunton in fog with a loss of one passenger and five crew members in March of 1903. Priscilla was rammed in heavy fog by Powhatan in 1902. And actually, it was, it's, it's an interesting, I think there's a photograph of it in one of these books. It was actually towed back to Newport attached to, to Puritan. The Lexington in 1935 had a collision in the East River and was cut in half, but all the passengers were saved. Two crewmen died. These were some of the major incidents, and there are photographs in some of these books of all, all these things happening, but again, for operating over a period of 90 years, the safety record was, was pretty incredible. I think that with the Fall River Line, I think the number of passengers that died in 91 years was something like three. They lost some crew, but they didn't, only passengers, I think it was three. Then comes the end. In 1937, by 1937, a lot of the public had, you know, gone away from steamboat travel. There were only two lines, well, actually, that's a mistake, there should be three. Three lines remained, the Fall River Line, the New Haven Line, and the Colonial Line. Those are the three that were left by 1937. New York, New Haven, and Hartford declared bankruptcy in 1935, although it continued to operate until 1968. But what happened in 1937 was that there came to be a, a union problem that had emerged in the 1930s. For a long time, going back to 18, 1888, the primary labor union was the American Federation of Labor. And AFL, under the leadership of Samuel Gompers, who was the president every year except one until 1923, 
Uh, that was the major labor union. But as you know, labor unions fell into disfavor in 1929 with the stock market crash and people being happy to get a job, let alone become a member of a union. Well, when in by 1931, when the unemployment rate in the United States had gone down from, it had been 31 percent, it was down to about 18 percent or so, the labor unions, the AFL, revived. But there was a splinter group from the AFL called the CIO, the Congress of Industrial Organizations. It split off from the AFL, and so what happens in 1937 on the New York waterfront, there's a lot of labor activity, I was going to say violence, but labor activity between the two unions. Unrest. Hmm? Unrest. Yeah, right. Unrest is good. Um, and that affected the dock workers in New York City. And so what happened, some of the workers on Commonwealth in June 30th, 1937, they went on a sit-down strike just as a load of about 1,400 passengers were about to depart from New York. They negotiated, they continued to negotiate. However, the line, I'm being cynical, was probably looking for an excuse about that time. And so the line announced that they were suspending service effective June, uh, July 30th, 20th, 1937. The trustees of the railroad, really, and the line petitioned the federal court for suspending operations and to sell the ships that were left. There were nine of them left. The unions, in a panic at that point, called for a settlement, called for negotiations to try to settle. But the die was cast. The, uh, the ships were uh, being put out for auction and the Fall River Line ceased its operation in its 91st year of its operation. Okay. Obviously a day of considerable mourning along the Sound and in the Bay. Uh, this is the announcement that was made. Fall River suspending July 20th and it goes into a lot of detail. There's, again, there's a better copy of this up in, I think it's in one of these books up here. And so they had the Fall River Line went out of business in July of 1937. Question was now, what are we going to do with these ships, especially these big, huge ships that they had? Well, the New York, New Haven, and Hartford did not want to allow them to be sold except for scrapping because they didn't want competition from the uh, other railroad lines that might buy them. And so they were only eligible to be sold for scrap. And so those four, the big four that I just mentioned, were sold for scrap. The Union Shipbuilding Company of Baltimore bought them $88,000. And they were to be dismantled. There are some pictures, some of the pictures that I have, actually, I found out by looking at some of these books, pictures I have of these ships that look pretty much abandoned sitting at Long Wharf were taken during that time when they were moved from Fall River and Newport to Baltimore. Between November and Jan November 37 and January 38, they were towed to Baltimore where they were scrapped. A very sad ending for the so-called floating palaces. As I mentioned, the Colonial Line continued to operate until it went out of business in 1942 during the war. And, and this is a very sad photograph of the scrap that was left over from some of the steamboats in the Baltimore, in Baltimore. Okay. Now, before these ships were scrapped, there, were, there was made available to, to everyone all kinds of artifacts, everything from you know, tickets to coffee cups to silverware and so on, all stamped. And there's a ton of that stuff around, by the way, even today. There are collectors of that stuff. I'm not one. But there are people who have all kinds of, of artifacts from the Fall River Line steamers. So the Fall River Line is the center of the sound steamers of that period. There were others, and there were a lot of competition. 
But I think that it's important to understand that it was a, by 1937-38, it was a, a, a type of thing that time had passed. Okay. I mean, we still can, can imagine a little bit of that by taking a steamboat to, or a, a, a ship to Block Island. But some of those are such high speed things that you don't even know you're on the water. Uh, but anyway, so there is some of that still left, some bay steamers. One other aspect of steamboats, though, that, that I'm particularly interested in, because again, I have a lot of photographs of, of Little Compton and Sakonet Point, is the Sakonet River steamers. The Sakonet River steamers were another line, much smaller, not anywhere near the magnificence of the Fall River line. And what happened with this was that they decided they wanted to run steamboats from Providence to Sakonet Point. And the first steamboat to do that was the Dolphin in 1885. The important person in Sakonet Point is a man by the name of Colonel Henry T. Sisson, a Civil War veteran. Colonel Sisson built the Stone House, which you're probably familiar with down at Sakonet Point. It's a hotel now. Um, and what Colonel Sisson did, and I have a map somewhere that shows this, he divided the whole Sakonet Point area up into quarter acre house lots. And he was very anxious to see it developed. In fact, one of the things that Colonel Sisson wanted to do was to run a trolley line from the Tiverton Railroad Station, which was just across the railroad bridge from here, and run a trolley line along Main Road down to Sakana Point. And eventually, the Tiverton rejected it at first, but eventually they said okay. And then by the time it was okayed, it was not a good idea anymore. Because by that time, by the 1880s, steamboats were running to Sakonet Point. Again, they didn't run for very long, but there were several steamboats, small steamboats, most of them built at the Brewer, uh, uh, no, I can't think of the name, Brewer, Maine is where they were built. And they were, most of them were, were in the vicinity of about 92 feet long. And their purpose also was to haul freight, fish, from Sakonet Point to the cities and so on. In 1886, a steamboat by the name of the Queen City, I'll show you a picture of it in a minute, under Captain J.A. Petty began to run from Providence to Sakonet Point. Again, primarily commercial for um, fish from the point and supplies the other way. I hope we all know that the Sak at Sakonet Point is an extraordinary location it was even more so before the hurricanes, but uh, it's really, to me, it's a very special place that I drive to a lot. In 1888, a hotel was built at the point by a man by the name of J.L. Slocum, and it came to be known as the Sakonet. And it was built there primarily to encourage uh, tourists and day trippers to come down. In 1891, it advertised 75 rooms available at $2.50 each. The hotel later was named the Lyman, as a man by the name of Thomas Lyman took it over. And uh, also at the point was a place called the Davis House. The Davis House was a shore dinner hall, a restaurant of sorts. So think about it, and, and actually I have a diary of a car trip from Newport to Sakonet Point. I can't remember how many hours it took. It took a long time to get there. You had to go you know, across this island, across Stone Bridge, through Little Com uh, Tiverton, then to Little Compton. Anyway, in the early days of the automobile. So the steamboats were really a good source of people coming to the point. In some cases, coming to the point just for a day trip. I have a schedule I'll show you in another slide here. But you could, you could go leave Providence, take about a two and a half hour trip, get to the point, go to the beach, go to the, the Davis house, and get back on and be home by six, six or seven o'clock at night. Queen City was one of the steamboats that ran to the point. Another was the Islander. And another one, they tell me in Little Compton, this is how you pronounce it, the Washonks. You don't pronounce the A at the beginning. Washonks, which was the name of an Indian, by the way, 
uh, who was at the time of Benjamin Church at the, uh, um, the, the war back in 1675 or so. was. He hoped an ally, but it didn't turn out to be that way. It was a woman. So the steamboats, most of them were built at Brewer, Maine, and Queen City burned at the wharf in 1907. It's the kind of point. But steamboat service lasted until 1919. Okay, so it was a relatively short period of time, but still. And, and you can go down to Sakana Point when the fishing boats come in and still see them hauling out barrels and barrels of fish, putting them on trucks now, and sending them off to market. Still do it. Here's some of the Sakana steamers. The top left is Queen City. Queen City is leaving Providence in this photograph. But what, one of the things you can see is on the bow of the, the uh, Queen City are a bunch of barrels. And the barrels were for picking up fish, bring it back. And then on the right is uh, the Islander. Again, all these were about 90 feet, 90, 95 feet. And at the bottom is Washonks. They, they didn't all go at the same time. They, they were different periods where some, and some were winter, some were summer, some were, and, in other words, they had different things. Here's an advertisement for the Sakana Hotel. You can't read it because it looks a little blurry there. But it has a timetable, and it's an advertisement for, uh, for the Davis House and for the Connet. The Davis House, I can read it here. You probably can't read it there. Here's, here's what you got at the Davis House for a meal. The place, gets, the place to get a first-class dinner at a reasonable price. Our regular dinner consisting of four courses, including chowder, fish, roast, meats, clam cakes, lobsters, cold meats, etc., with pudding or pie, 50 cents. <laughs> we also cook to order any and all, uh, anyway, all, anything you want, essentially. Cool, chaste, comfortable, about one minute from the steamboat landing. What a bargain, huh? Oh, the, the fare on the boat, most of the time the fare on the boat was about $2, $2 and a half from <coughs> Providence, from Providence to the point. Okay, here's another ad that has some of the same stuff. This has a timetable on it. Again, it depends on the time of year. I'm, uh, they didn't, they only ran for freight pretty much in the wintertime. And here are two pictures of the hotel. It's pretty substantial, a big porch all the way around. You have nice comfortable chairs look, overlooking the ocean. If you go to Sakonet Point, you, come, you approach Sakonet uh, Point. Before you turn right to go to the end of the point, it was sort of straight ahead. It was right, right at the head of the, the road that was going down there. And here's a picture of the Davis House and a picture of the steamboat tied up to the, the wharf and then people just walk. These, these women and these kids here are about uh, 30 feet from the Davis House. It was right at the point. Okay. This is one of my favorite postcards. I think it's one of the first postcards I got, but it's really one of my favorites. It's the Islander <coughs> coming through the uh, Sakonet River. You can almost date this picture because on the right, the uh, left here, is a steamboat, a small steamboat, probably the J.A. Saunders that was being used to bring people across the Sakana River because the stone bridge was being rebuilt. And, and, and I think I have another postcard of this which shows it just a little bit further and you can see the ruins of the bridge. But they used two small boats, the J.A. Saunders and the West Side to bring people across at a time when there was no other way to get across the river or the bay except by ferry. But what's kind of interesting in this picture also is that you have part of Island Park here and it ends at O'Neill's Point down here. There wasn't any escape bridge. The escape bridge was built in 1962 after the results of the 38 hurricane when people got trapped down there. Anyway, this is, you can see the road barely. So there's roads here. And this is Valhalla. Okay. The line of trees there is Chase's Road, East Main Road, down past the post office. No houses. 
This, this postcard is about, is, is, it's either 1908 or 1912. One of my favorite postcard producers is a man by the name of, of O.E. Du Bois from Fall River. And you, some of you have heard me say this before. You can recognize his because of the, the type name and the number. Uh, in 1983, I had 60 of his postcards of the, uh, of the area from Westport to uh, Portsmouth. And so I did a book on him. <clears throat> I had 60 of his postcards. I now have 620 of his postcards. <laughs> he was really prolific. He was an excellent photographer. And probably three-fourths of them he put a number on, which makes him a lot easier not to buy twice. <laughs> okay. uh, but I do collect his, his work, which is which quite extraordinary. He's a, a photographer from Fall River. He lived on uh, Wilcox Street. And he would just get in his horse and buggy and ride off to the Sakonet area and take pictures. A lot of his pictures are of houses, but a lot of them are scenic like this. Really great photographs. It's a, it's a real treasure trove. And since I started collecting, I combined with, with the Little Compton Historical Society and about four other collectors. And we put all our collections together by number so that we have a good idea of, of what, we, what he did. He just went everywhere. And, and his years of doing this, by the way, were mostly from about 1908 to 1913. And they're all real photo, black and white, well, sepia tone postcards. And, but just look at that. I mean, it's just a wonderful photograph. It's really great to have. So in conclusion, the steamboat era was from Firefly in 1817 to the end of the Fall River Line, although again there were a couple years after that there were some steamboats around. But it really was an important era of ship travel, and especially between Fall River, Newport, and New York. And it really must have been fun to make that trip. I don't know, I've talked to a lot of people, older people who remember it or I did in my youth anyway, I don't much anymore. Uh, but uh, it, on a warm summer night and orchestras playing and all kinds of meals being served and everything was really, must have been really special. So we've seen some of the highlights of the era. I, I would, there, there's so much more research that can be done on some of these other steamboat lines. There's a whole book here on the uh, Joy Line. And the Joy Line was only in business for about 20 years. But there's just a whole bunch of stuff up here. And I, I, we have some time. You can come up and take a look at it afterwards. So the topic of steamboats, thanks, Gary, uh, is, can be researched much more thoroughly, much more into it. Um, I spent a lot of time putting this together. But I, I think it's really a fascinating era of local history, which you hear about. You, you know, People talk about, oh, remember the old forward line, things like that. But, but if you really look at it close up and you consider the number of people that rode these steamboats from Fall River or Newport to New York, just scads and scads of people. Really cool. And, and traveling on floating palaces. That was the nickname that was given to them. So there's much more possible research to be done. With that in mind, I'll allow you a few minutes for questions. If anybody has anything, I will try to answer. Carlton. Yeah, Jim, all the photographs in there, they had lifeboats on the, uh, the various steamboats. Were there enough lifeboats to take care of everybody on board in case of a disaster? Uh, allegedly, there were. They, they, they advertised that there were. Uh, but something like the Larchmont, when it was destroyed very quickly, you know, the lifeboats went with the ship. There was no time. I think it was, was it 17 minutes, something like that, that it sank really quickly. I'm reading a book right now about the Lusitania, and, and Lusitania sank in about a half, less than a half hour, and about 1,100 people died, okay. including Cornelius, uh, Cornelius, Alfred Gwynne Vanderbilt of Portsmouth. Yes? Um, any, any estimate of how many passengers were on, were on those lines over the years? I've never seen a, a cumulative number. No. Uh, it might be in... The, this book, The Floating Palaces, which Roger Williams, McAd Roger Williams McAdam wrote that. He wrote it in 1937 when the lines were ending, and then that, that's an update of 1980. Uh, that number might be in there. I've never really come across it. it it's in the millions, I mean, geez. Yeah. When you consider that the Commonwealth could carry 1,500 people one night to New York, and did often, I mean, I, I, don't, I 
can't imagine how they get so many people on the train to get on the steamboat, I wonder. Although it stopped at different places. One thing, I, I, let me go back to one. The Sakonet line, when they ran, they stopped about four places between Providence and Sakonet Point, by the way. And you can pick up passengers at Bristol Ferry uh, or at uh, Almy's Wharf in Tiverton and a few other places, but let's throw that up. Yes? Uh, none of these steamboats have survived. These well, there are steamboats. These ones. No, no, there's nothing left from any of these. I mean, we, we had some, some of the boats that ran out of Warren, you know, over the last 15 years or so, I mean, they were pretty sizable boats. And there are, I guess there are still some that, that cruise around the bay in the summer and certainly go to Block Island. But uh, no, none of, none of this line. In fact, that, that was the fear by the owners that, that somebody was going to buy them and, and compete with them. You know, a railroad company is going to buy them and compete. So they, that's why they insisted on them being broken up. So sad. Really good. Yes? Did they mix economic classes all together on this? It sounds like a cattle call yeah. with people jammed in there. But I know. A court, if you were wealthy, were you in a separate section from there, the other? In terms, of, in terms of your cabins, yes. In terms of, of you know, in the saloons, probably not. I mean, there were a lot of people who traveled. There was something like four or five presidents of the United States traveled on the Fall River Line. Uh, but there, was, there were first class people. How they mixed, I'm not sure. I, I, I have a feeling there were certain places that the common people were not asked to go. <laughs> you know? I mean, there were, there were, the restaurants were just huge and, and went all the way, the whole beam of the ship. But there were, there were restaurants for the special people and otherwise. Another question, how did they prepare the food on there? Was there a kitchen or was it brought on? They, they had substantial kitchens, but I'm sure some of it was pre-prepared pre yeah, before, you know. But the menus were incredible. I mean, the menus, you could get anything. It's amazing. And, and again, by any kind of today's standards, inexpensive. But that's all relative, obviously, we, we know that. I mean, a cabin for $1.50, wow. <laughs> 50 cents for that lobster dinner. <laughs> Any other quick questions? Well, I, I do want to give you a few minutes. They're going to kick us out of here in about 10 minutes, but we do have a, a few minutes you can come up. We're going to turn the lights back on and you can look at some of this stuff up here. And I'll be glad to answer any of your questions. One final thing is I wrote a book on transportation on and around Aquinnick Island back in 1907 or something like that. And I have a couple of those up here if you want to. Um, they're available. Uh, there are Beyond the four that are here, uh, there are seven copies left in the world. <laughs> That's all. My first three books of all, I, I don't have any of them. I mean, I have one or two, but uh, essentially they've all been sold. So I have to start thinking about writing something else when I get time. Anyway.
tale across the ocean and be halfway up the Rhine. While you take a trip in a battleship on the old Fall River line. On the old Fall River line. On the old Fall River line. I lost an 18 carat what a super, super fine. I got into someone's trousers, then someone got into mine. You can lose your life, yes, and lose your wife on the old Fall River line.